How did you develop the single stroke roles that you play around the set so effortlessly? That's a good question. I, uh, and this is something I, I talk about in my clinics. I, I spent a lot of time practicing on pillows. And that's something I learned from talking to Buddy Rich at a very young age. You know, he was saying that, you know, if you want, if you want these great chops, uh, you should practice, you know, playing on a pillow, like a down pillow, something that don't have any rebound, right. such as a pillow. And you just practice on single stroke rolls and double stroke rolls for long periods of time. So therefore, when you get on the drums, uh, you find, well, you have another problem once you start playing a drum kit, is what happened is your, your hands are moving faster than your limbs, actually. Mm -hmm. So therefore, then you have to redo everything as far as like getting the limbs to, to go where, you know, where you want them to go fast as your hands are moving. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, I just learned how to play fast by playing on pillows or playing on like real dead surfaces. Right. Now, was that another way in which Billy Cobham influenced you? Billy Cobham influenced me in, in a way where it was like, uh, you know, just just learn how to play like the, the, the toms or just learn how to do drum solos and because uh, I, I, you know, I mean, Buddy Rich had fast hands. He had phenomenal hands, you know, but when I saw Billy play, it was just another way of another way of thinking about playing the drums, you know, being real flashy and, and it's just the way he expressed mm. himself on the drums just it was phenomenal. So I really dug that. And I lean towards that side of it more. What about Tony Williams? Did you get to see him play with Miles? Yeah, I got a chance to see Miles you know, at a very young age. Uh, I think when I saw him, it was like 1966 or 65. I can't remember. Uh -huh. you know, these guys walked in, and you know, Tony just played like you know he played like the cops were outside waiting for him. <laughs> you know. And at that time, that stuff was like over my head, you know, mm -hmm. it was like all this energy, all this plan, and I, I had no idea what it was about, you know. But one thing I, I, I recognized out of his plan was that uh, he, he looked very relaxed when he played. Mm -hmm. And he just sat there, and he had all these phenomenal rhythms going, and it was like no movement, you know, no body movement. You know, he showed a few expressions, and that was it. I mean, it was like, you know, he just looked comfortable. Looked like he was sitting in his living room, like reading a newspaper or something. That's how comfortable the guy looked. And you know, at a very young age, I mean, you know, you know, seeing that, I'd figure, well, you know, that's what I want to look like when I'm playing. Like uh, I talked to a few drummers about it, you know, and they were telling me, well, you know, why don't you just practice with a mirror? You know, you just set set a mirror like right beside you, and you practice, you know, for hours, just like, you know keeping the limbs down, because Tony, you never see his hands come up here. Uh -huh. It was always down here, you know, at the drums. Maybe, you know, like when you, when you see his arms go up, it's like when he's doing these cymbal things, these little triplet right. things he does. Can you play some of that? Yeah. Well, he had one thing that went like this. I would take one thing that I learned from him and try to create other things off of that, such as this. You know, and then that wasn't good enough. I, I wanted to, to do uh, little things with my right hand uh, off, of the, off of those same patterns. And re the reason for that is, you know, when I do stuff like this,
you know, and then there was this, this thing called a sweep. Oh, is what Baltimore drummers called it when they see me do this. And the sweep sort of goes like this. It's just alternating between the snare drum and the floor tom, uh, which sort of sounds like a paradiddle, you know, with the bass drum in there. And then I wanted to add other drums, you know, like uh, the tom-toms, mounted tom-toms, which got a little more involved. But there's another thing I do a lot in my solos, is, which is, is called the cross-sticking of, you know, playing the cymbals with the bass drum playing, or the double bass drum playing. Right. Which sounds like this. That's great. Can you slow that down a little bit? What's the, the, is it the same pattern you were playing before, but moved to the cymbals? Right. Mm -hmm. kind of hard to do when you know slowing it down for me anyway but that's what it is
I've noticed in uh, some of the solos you've been doing that you seem to have a reference in your mind, even when it's an open solo, that you seem to be thinking of some, maybe some specific grooves or, as you say, there is a, always a reference. Sometimes when I solo, I think about, like, melodies, you know, of other tunes. Uh, or I'm thinking about, like, what's going on around me at the time. You know, something that, you know, uh, you know, one of the other musicians played. You know, I'll, like, take it from there and try to develop and that into something in my solo. There's one thing I do with the bass drum. It's a uh, three-beat triplet on the bass drum. And how it's set up, it's two beats on the right, one beat on the left. And the reason for that is because I have to play the hi-hat at the same time. With your left. Mm -hmm. With my left, which is creating the time for me, right? And then, uh, you know, I'm soloing a lot of things, or doing a lot of things over top of that, but one point of the, one point of the or some given point in that solo, you know, I would do something, you know, like a melody, you know, sometimes, most of the times I would do something like take five, right? Which sounds like this. You know, while I'm playing a three beat triplet and going in, the, in to take five, I would slow the top part of it down against, I mean, this stays where it is. The mm -hmm. bottom half stays where it is. I'm just speeding, it, speeding the top up and slowing it down. What about practicing? What type of uh, different routines have you had? You know, I would practice to a, you know, drum machine uh, or when they were made available for, for drummers. Uh, you know, everybody was like into taking drum machines and, and you know, like duplicating or put the drummer out of business, so to speak. I took, you mm -hmm. know, I would like take a drum machine and, uh, you know, play all kind of rhythms or program all these rhythms into it uh, just so I can play off of it. And there was two reasons why I did that is because one reason is because I couldn't get musicians to come over to the house. And uh, or the, the ones I wanted to come over never could come over. Um, and the other reason is is that you know I wanted to also develop some kind of decent time. Because you know at the time uh, when I was going in the studio when I was cutting some P funk stuff, uh, you know I would play to a click track. And I had to learn how to play with a click track. So the best way to learn how to play with a click track is just take a, you know, for me it was at the time, it was just take a machine and just play to a machine or play with the machine. Mm -hmm. When I'm in the studio nowadays, you know, producers, like, they, they get a little freaked out because how I play with a, with a sequence of track is I'll play to the, exist, the existing drum track that's on the, on the, on the track. Mm -hmm. And not play nowhere near what the track is doing or what I'm hearing. I'm not playing nowhere near it. So they're wondering, like, how can you play or do what you do over top of what's going on there that don't have anything to, to do with what I'm playing? Mm -hmm. Rather than just a straight cowbell on right. playing four beats to a yeah, bar. I, you know, I hate that click, click, uh -huh. click, click. I hate that feel. 
Mm -hmm. So I'd rather have just the existing drum track that's in the on the track, and I'll just play to it or play against it. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's I I learned how to do that just by playing against drum drum machines.
Gary, he's a very percussive bass player. You know, when he played with his thumbs, there were some times on, on the tour, I remember, I didn't know who was playing drums. Was it me or him? <laughs> because, it, you know, he had this Music Man bass that had a big range of uh, frequencies. You know, he had covered the low end great and it covered the high end. He had a very snapping high end mm -hmm. and he had a serious low end, mm -hmm. you know. And when he had the right rig, it sounded like a drummer was playing. Uh huh which was great, you know. So therefore, that's how I learned, you know, that's how we learned how to play off each other the way we did. Because, you know, he was playing all this percussion stuff and I'm playing the drums and, you know, I'm playing all this weird stuff off of him, you know. All right, Gary, play something around this.
Dennis, there's two really distinct sides to your playing, actually three. The one is your incredible, strong groove playing. The other is your technique. And the third is your musicality, what you bring to songs just by listening and so forth. Uh, you've made some quotes in the past about drummers spending too much time in the practice room and not enough time listening to the musicians they're playing with. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, there are drummers who like sit and practice all day, and you know when they when they go out and play with a band, they sound like what they sound like they're practicing. Mm -hmm. And and it's all because a lot of times the drummers don't really listen to what's going on around them, or try to be musical. You know, I mean, because the whole thing, the reason why the drummer is there is to keep time, and and create this nice strong pocket or nice strong groove, and you know just. You know, make the thing sound like it. You know, make the thing sound comfortable. You know, but you take that to another level, especially in the Schofield band. The dynamic range is incredible. The parts blue matter starts out, and then there's slamming sections and very quiet. Yeah, but there again, that's that's also has to do. That has something to do with my surroundings at that mm -hmm. moment. You know, I mean, you can't help but to be or to play like that when you have a bass player that, that's play, you know, who plays like Gary Granger, who's pulling those things out of you. Right. Uh, and John, you know, I just couldn't help but to play like that. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank <laughs> you.